Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome. I'd like to introduce Ryan Wyant of the LGBTQ plus real estate Alliance. Uh, Ryan is passionate about people, people he works with, the people he works for and the community he works in and the people who surround him. He identifies as an agent for an advocate of diversity, equity and inclusion and is passionate about organizational change and development. Ryan takes on life with the belief that the grass is greener where you water it. He, is, he feels blessed to have grown up in an environment where he was able to be who he was, but encouraged to act ethically, morally, and fairly through all aspects of life. Ryan served nearly a decade in the lending and financial services industry, most of, most of which was as a private mortgage banker and loan officer with Wells Fargo, and most recently a loan officer with U.S. Bank in the Twin Cities. He also launched Raw Insight, which is an organizational development consulting firm. Uh, prior to his lending career, Ryan held a variety of senior roles with firms in operations and event management. He has served on the Minnesota Realtors Diversity and Inclusion Committee and previously led the Nagel Rep Foundation, along with being a past president of that organization's Minneapolis chapter for multiple years. The University of St. Thomas grad completed his master's work in organizational leadership from St. Catherine University. Uh, Ryan is happily married to his husband, Michael, since New Year's Eve 2019-2020. They live in St. Paul, Minnesota, but enjoy traveling to the extent their schedules allow. Welcome, Ryan. I felt a bit of kinship when I read your bio because we have the same anniversary. Oh, look at that. I have a few years on you. We do, but because we're old, but there you go. Well, Sandy, you can't, <laughs> you can't tell by looking at you virtually. That's any consolation. <laughs> Many, many, many years. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And I got to tell you, it sounds a lot better when someone else reads my bio than when I do. So I appreciate <laughs> the entire thing also. That's awesome. So want to get right into it today and start off with you just telling us about the Alliance and um, what you're doing and how our members can get involved. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Liz and Sandy, to, to be with you all. Um, I suppose this morning, it just turned noon in the Twin Cities, but it's it's 10 o'clock for you all. Um, so I, I'm grateful and I value the opportunity, hopefully, to share some information and insight about the Alliance and, and the different projects and the programs that we're working on and certainly would welcome questions at the end. But it's it's been quite a year, to say the least. And the Alliance was born almost a year ago. It'll, on the 22nd, actually, of this month, it'll be one year um, since almost 70 of us got together on a call very comparable to this uh, with a lot of tiles um, and had a conversation. And, and frankly, it evolved out of a desire to be more transparent and do better than um, the place which we had come from. And uh, we decided to take it to the next level. And, and so we reached out to the, the folks over at NAR. At the time, it was a mentor of mine, Fred Underwood, who, who ran the diversity, equity, and inclusion program there. Fred has since retired. Uh, wish him the best, obviously. And Fred guided us through the process. Fred's first comment was, form a steering committee. And I pride myself on my master's in organizational development. And there was silence. There was dead air on the phone because I didn't know what he was talking about. Um, and I said, tell me more, Fred. What does this look like? Uh, and he said, well, get the, the folks that have the passion and the masterminds together on a call and, and figure out what your goals are. Decide where you want to take this and, and how you want to get there. So we did. And we spent a matter of weeks and then it turned into months mapping out a very strategic vision of where we wanted this new organization to go and how we wanted to build it from the foundation up. We were blessed, and I use that word very intentionally, to have the opportunity to really engineer the alliance to be what we thought uh, other organizations were lacking, and we were able to do that from the beginning, which means we didn't have to erase anything. We didn't have to hit a reset button. Um, we could organize and engineer what an organization looked like literally from the beginning. So if you fast forward, now we've got roughly, I don't know, 80 to 100 folks involved in this. There are committees that have evolved for branding, for naming, um, everything from education to policy to advocacy. Uh, and it had really taken on a life and a spirit of its own where the formalization just kind of naturally took place. On, uh, I know this date, on September 3rd, I actually filed incorporation paperwork with the IRS. We were a Minnesota nonprofit corporation, 
And that 501c6 approval was approved and backdated to June 22nd. So very grateful to the IRS for that. So you're saying, okay, what's a C6? I know what a C3 is, it's a charity. A C6 is like NAR or, or frankly, Liz, I would imagine like Washington Realtors. It's a true member professional organization. It's just like your chamber of commerce, for instance. Uh, whereas a C3 is a, a charity like your American Red Cross and a C4 is a, a PAC or a political action committee. Um, as a C6, we have the ability to both leverage our strength um, economically and politically, but campaigning and advocacy and policy cannot be our main function. So we are fortunate that we have a very broad platform of issue items that we can work on and devote energy to. On October 1st of 2020, we opened the doors to membership. Uh, we had to build a website from scratch, which hopefully if you haven't seen it, it's realestatealliance, all one word, dot org, O-R-G, not dot com. I don't think that one exists. Um, and we weren't sure what to expect to be candid. We obviously were all very optimistic and wanted the best. And in a short period of time, we had rolled past 500 members and then 1,000 members. Um, and as of this morning, we have over 1,300 members in the Alliance. Uh, and that momentum continues to grow. I'll give you all a, a sneak peek at what's to come. The end of this week, we actually announce our partnership, our formal partnership with the Canadian Real Estate Association. And some of you might have noticed uh, a couple of headlines out of the media from last week when the National Association of Realtors announced that they were at the table as well with a champion level sponsorship of the Alliance, which we were incredibly humbled and grateful for. That was a, a relationship that had taken a lot of time and finesse on both sides to iron out. Um, we partner with everything from California realtors to uh, Arcadia realtors. So associations of all sizes in the real estate world. We're also proud to have the National Association of Mortgage Bankers and the Mortgage, I beg your pardon, Mortgage Brokers and MBA, the Mortgage Banker Association at the table as well. We consider ourselves now that uh, I always say, it's kind of like NAR is the queen of England, right? And we just got knighted by the queen. So I, I can say this confidently that we are now one of the diverse segments in the real estate industry um, acknowledged by NAR. And we join our peers and our friends at the Women's Council, at VA Rep, ARIA, um, NA Rep and NAREB, uh, with that honor. And we are fortunate to actually have ironed out and signed agreements. Again, this press release will be hitting in the next two weeks as well uh, with ARIA, the Asian Real Estate Association, um, as well as NAREP, which was announced several weeks ago. Um, and we lean on each other very heavily for collaboration and, um, and thought leadership exchange. I say that and I bring that up specifically because it's important as we go through this discussion to keep in mind that the LGBTQ population is a direct reflection on general society at large. We have Latinos, we have Asian Americans, we have Catholics, we have folks who, who practice the Jewish faith, we have conservatives and liberals. We have folks of all ability um, and ability variants. You don't have a predisposed type if you are in our community. We reflect society as it truly is. So bearing that in mind, it's important that we keep the different intersectionality in mind as well, and that we are forging relationships with folks like NAREP, like ARIA. We have a pending agreement right now with VA Rep, which is the Veterans Association. Um, so we're, we're hoping that we're doing a lot of good things. We have a very robust education platform, which uh, I think I'll, I'll hit on a little bit later. We have a great advocacy platform. If any of you were able to join us in April for our, our policy and advocacy symposium, we had an absolute phenomenal uh, two-day event. We cut it down to four hours a day, so we didn't zoom people out too quick. Um, but we are very fortunate to have some amazing speakers, everyone from uh, Senator Sherrod Brown, who chairs the, the Senate Banking and, and Housing Committee, to Representative Angie Craig, who is um, the first openly lesbian woman in Congress, also one of the co-authors of the Equality Act. We've got a huge conference coming up at the end of September in Las Vegas at the brand new Resorts World Property. Very excited about that. I can tell you, for those of you who know her, Christine W. will be performing at uh, the last night, our President's Ball. We're very excited about that. We're, we're currently in discussions with Secretary Fudge of HUD, as well as Secretary Buttigieg as well, uh, for some keynote. And it, 
sounds like if we can get the schedules hammered out, they're both very receptive to joining us. So that's going to be a wonderful event. Um, and as some of you know, I, I see some friendly faces on here. We just kicked off Pride Month. And as much as we wanted to have Pride be a destination event, um, COVID and the nation had other plans, as it has for the last year and a half. Uh, so we look forward to 2020 when Pride will be a destination month-long event. We're going to identify five different cities each year and partner with that state's realtor association and do some great collaborations. Everything from first time home buyer seminars in person to attending the festival and the parade. So I think, I hope we have a, a solid program in place. We're learning and evolving every day. We have four full-time staff dedicated to this. And I'd say a fleet of 75 volunteers who are, I don't wanna say part-time because that doesn't do them justice, but um, just like a realtor association, hands on constantly. So that's kind of a, a very high level of, of where we started to where we are now. That's awesome. That's amazing the amount of growth that you've had in such a short period of time. Like one year you went from planning to you've already had major conferences and you've got a major national conference planned and um, the collaborations and the partnerships that you've created, it's, that's amazing. You guys have been working <laughs> well, you know, that's Sandy, and I think it's a direct reflection of where we are societally. We have a lot of folks that have been coming to us and seeking partnerships, and it's a huge testament to how far we have gone um, just in the face of equality over the last, well, even 10 years. Um, so you're right, it has been exciting. And the, the joke between my board and I, um, I, I do answer to a, an elected board of directors, um, I've had to rewrite my five-year strategic goals twice now because we keep shattering where I thought we'd be. Um, so much so that we're actually, we're going to be taking on international expansion next year. The Latin American Chamber of Commerce reached out to us and they want to see a presence in three different countries. Um, and between our international relationships with folks at Realogy and England Volkers, there are nine different European countries that have expressed interest. So I, I had to hit the pause button after we brought Canada on successfully and, and just tell everyone that we needed to wait until we had a, a very solid structure in place before we crossed an ocean. Yes, those are horrible problems to have though, really. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So how, how um, active has the Seattle market been? Have you... Is, I believe that there is a Seattle chapter, correct? And there is. And, you know, okay. I think what we're what we're coming down to, and I, I smirk a little bit because we have Gene Brake on the call and, and uh, cats out of the bag, Gene. We're in discussions with Gene on potentially opening an Eastern Washington chapter. Nice. Gene's out in Spokane. So we need some representation on that side of the state. But I will tell you that the Seattle chapter has really evolved more into a Western Washington chapter. Um, our chapter president actually lives on Bainbridge Island. So he represents a swath all uh, up and down the sound. There is programming that is going on. Um, the, the chapter president's name is Togasi, phenomenal human being. Uh, he was a naval officer. He actually chairs the Alliance's um, veteran and military ARG. We have ARGs, which are called Alliance Resource Groups. Any of you with corporate experience recognize those as team member networks or employee resource groups. So he does, uh, he fills a couple purposes for us, leading the, the Western Washington chapter and running our, our military and vets ARG. I know that we just opened the doors and I will take full responsibility for this as much as some of my chapter presidents around the country have been bucking it. Um, we were not allowing our chapters to meet in person until June 1st. So we're now three days into it. Um, and the folks in Florida love that we're open again because all of our Florida chapters, five of which we have, uh, already have had their first events. So we're excited now with the rest of the country opening up. I think California is coming in last on, on June 15th. But uh, it'll give folks that opportunity to get back together again in person, dust off your business cards, actually have a, a soda or a cocktail with, with other peers, um, and make those connections that are so critical to our chapter program. That's great. That's amazing. So what are, just to move on a little bit, what are some of the, the current real estate trends and issues you're seeing uh, if there are anything, if there, if it's different with the LGBTQ community, um, as far as home ownership rates, access to mortgages, first time home buyers, um, and across the country, where are areas that are more inclusive to the LGBTQ community? 
It's a lot of questions in there. It <laughs> is a lot of questions. Please take them um, one at a time. <laughs> well, I think the most important thing to highlight uh, the overarching theme is the importance of the Equality Act. And I say that, and I've, I'm going to keep hammering that in, um, because in 27 states in this great nation today, it's still legal, L-E-G, legal, not illegal, to discriminate against folks in our community in purchasing, selling, renting, financing, and extending shelter. And that catches a lot of folks off guard, especially those of us who live in blue states. I'm in Minnesota, a notoriously blue state, and we take things for granted here. Uh, I had a very comparable conversation with the folks at, at California Realtors. They didn't realize it was that extensive. Um, but the reality is that, unfortunately, it is. So with legal discrimination in so many areas, um, <laughs> I'll use the word dismal, the, the home ownership rate in our community is dismally low. Um, it is coming in at 49% as opposed to the mainstream general population's home ownership rate of 64%. Um, in fact, we just released a, a white paper about two weeks ago now, um, which Gene Brake contributed some wonderful uh, firsthand experience to, um, which shows a correlation between discrimination and a lower home ownership rate. And that's not just applicable to our community, that's applicable to any minority community. Um, we partnered with Williams Institute out of UCLA and Freddie Mac to do that white paper. It's out there. It's available on our website as a free download. Um, but what I found fascinating, Sandy, is that we looked at the LGBTQ experience, let's say, through all facets of, of lifespan, going all the way back to elementary school. And we identified patterns of bullying or harassment or discrimination. And those link all the way back to elementary school those impact someone's potential to be a homeowner later in life. And it really makes sense if you think about it. If you're focused on, or I should say predisposed on bullying and being a victim of discrimination in your, your early education years, that's going to impact your ability to get into college just through the impact it has on your grades. Your impact of not getting into college or perhaps not succeeding in college is going to have an impact on your earning potential more or less which is a direct correlation to your purchase power. So there is a, a very serious link there. And you know that's why we say that we are pro-housing. We're not pro-real estate. We're not pro-mortgage. We're everything in housing. And the advocacy side of what we do is so important. Um, and now we have statistical data to back up the importance of, of ending bullying and ending discrimination and that there is a true economic consequence, not just an emotional and mental consequence to that. So the home ownership rates are low and we have a lot of work to do. We look forward to, to working with our partners, working with HUD, working with the Congressional Equality Caucus to, to raise those rates over the next five to 10 years. As far as mortgages are concerned, Sandy, I, I'm a mortgage professional for 10 years. I can't give you any data on it because it's not collected. We have absolutely no idea other than the instances that are reported to the National Fair Housing Alliance of discrimination and what that looks like. But I will tell you, um, they do see a, a rather high rate of discriminatory behavior, which then they go on and bring actually to um, hearings to determine if there was a violation warranted. And then the NF National Fair Housing teams up with HUD, there's a whole process involved. Uh, the most recent case that was just brought to my attention was in Kentucky. Um, a lender straight up denied a gay couple with a 730 credit score combined, ample funds for a down payment, and two other banks had them conventional approved. So that's being looked into right now. It's an ongoing case. I will tell you that it does happen. I don't know how often it's reported. And, and certainly I can't give you demographics on how many folks in our community finance versus purchasing cash because uh, that information isn't recorded anywhere. Um, first time home buyers, interesting question. We have a largely transient community. And I say that because the rental rates show that folks in our community are typically in one location for two to three years at a time, and then move on to their next location. And whether that's a reflection of a desire to always be in the heart of the action, or maybe the opposite of that and just getting tired of living in a downtown setting, especially after COVID. I, I think everyone can agree that being confined to 600 square feet in a pandemic is not a cakewalk. So now we're seeing folks starting to migrate to the suburbs. There's a couple of reasons for that. If you historically look at timelines, 
we're about six years out from marriage equality passing the Supreme Court. About five to six years into a relationship, traditionally folks start to look at children. Um, and we're seeing that in our community. The adoption rate is skyrocketing right now. And so the correlation between migration to the suburbs from downtown settings and family um, is real. And it, I hope, presents a great opportunity for us to see an increase in home ownership rates. Um, I've got a question and I'm gonna kind of phrase it the way that I think it was intended. And if whoever wrote this question is on the call and I am botching it, and this is not what you intended, please speak up. Um, but the question is why, how can people expand their businesses by attracting more LGBTQ plus clients? And for me, that's, I feel like that's asking, how do we convey to folks in our marketing or just in daily interactions with folks that as, some clients that I spoke with told me they were excited to work with someone who was queer friendly. How, how can we convey that to folks? Um, and actually, you know, maybe make us create a situation where they actually seek us out because we are sensitive to their needs and their situation and want to be helpful um, and um, make sure that they're treated fairly and equitably, um, what's the best way about going to go about that? Yeah, great question. Um, and there are a few ways I'd like to answer that. Obviously, I have, I have a bias to our organization, but I think the question um, is much larger than just our organization. I think the first piece of advice I could give, offer an equitable experience to all of your clients. If there is a, a pair of women that walk into your open house, do not assume that they're sisters, but also don't assume that it's a lesbian couple. Treat them just like you'd treat any other couple that walked in or any other pair that walked into your open house. And it's okay to ask questions. The word used to be androgynous and, and we don't use that word anymore, but um, I'm guessing there are a few boomers on the call that recognize that word. If there's someone that you're not able to visually identify and you don't know how to address that person, it is acceptable and okay to ask what their pronouns, their personal pronouns are. And that's something that you should be comfortable asking. I don't think if it's in a in the right tone with the right intent that anyone's going to take offense by that. Um, so it's just a general awareness to make sure that you're staying on point, you're bringing your best self um, with you to work when you're working with your clients and giving everyone an equitable experience. Now, specifically, if you're talking about working with our community, the word we use is, is ally or allyship. And we refer to folks who are on the straight side of society, but extend an olive branch to us or find an attraction with working with our community, we call those folks allies. And really that term can be extended to any diverse segment or minority group. Um, it's, it's just not as widely used as it is with the LGBTQ community. So the Alliance offers a wonderful education platform, which I, I alluded to earlier. One of the things that we are offering that actually starts deploying at the end of this month is our Alliance Certified Ally Program. This is a two-hour credentialing program um, that NAR has evaluated uh, several times now and has blessed this. It is a proprietary credential to the Alliance, um, but it does come with its own insignia that you're able to use on any of your marketing, be it a business card or your electronic signature. Um, and it's basically a stamp of approval saying that you have taken the time to get the basic education of what the LGBTQ experience in America might be. This is a 101 course. This is not a, a high level structured um, course. This is a, a building box, a real foundation course, which allows our allies that want to work with our community, the basic understanding on pronouns, on identity versus orientation. Um, explain the acronym. You know, I think, I think we're now at 16 letters in the acronym. Most of us cut it off after the Q or the two. Um, you'll see LGBTQ2 if you're working in Europe or Canada. That two, uh, it stands for two-spirited, two which is largely a native and indigenous um, term, but it is being widely accepted and included around the world now. So really, you know, I think taking the time 
as it is with any minority community, to give yourself an education and to be receptive um, to the fact that you might not know everything there is to know and want to learn. So we offer that program. I'd encourage uh, folks to, to watch that. I know Liz and I have had some conversation high level about potentially offering that for Washington Realtors in the fall um, or more towards the end of the year. So that would be a great opportunity. We also have a CE course that we're going, it, it's a real chore to get through all 50 states for CE approval, but we're on that path. Um, and we hope to bring it to, to the West Coast the first part of next year for full CE credit. So those are our, our, a couple different methods um, specifically to reach out to our community. I'll also say that our website offers um, a very strategically placed directory for consumers to connect with professionals who are members of the Alliance. We have 10% of our membership right now identifying as allies, which is a huge achievement in my eyes. And the internal referral network is very strong, but I will tell you yesterday we launched a consumer landing page and are going to start driving real money towards generating consumer leads for our members. And obviously the folks have asked, is there a cost to that? Well, the cost is the membership dues that you pay every year. Um, and those membership dues should be generating an ROI for our members and should be helping fund our chapter program. So we are very excited for that. We've had some great response already. Um, and we're also putting on a first time home buyer seminar at the end of this month. Uh, we opened registration almost seven days ago and, and we have over 72 consumers who have already registered for this. Now, obviously those folks are going to need uh, real estate professionals as well. So our hope is to connect those folks with people in our directory. I think one more, I, this is long-winded, Sandy, and I apologize, oh, but no, one please. thing I'd like to add, just with respect to the beginning of your question, our community, the LGB, the American LGBTQ community has $1.7 trillion in collective purchase power. That makes us the 10th largest economy in the world. The nine before us are all major industrialized nations. So there is not just an ethical and moral, in my opinion, imperative to start breaking down these walls, but it's good business too. There is a lot of money stored in our community. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, we enjoy spending it. <laughs> That's awesome. That's that I the everything that you've got going on is just it amazes me again that you've done it in such a short period of time because you were just on top of everything it seems with this group. Um, well, Sam, I'll tell you, you know, and and truthfully, I think this should be said. It's not like we started from scratch. Right. We have a yeah. Very. Uh, I, I mean, I can't tell you how comprehensive the team that we've put together is, and we all complement each other's um, shortcomings very well. And we all work together very comprehensively. Um, Mary Mancera, who runs our business development relationship management, spent almost 12 years at NAREP, the Hispanic Association. Um, David Sirodi, who does our, our PR and communications, was 25 years at Coldwell Corporate uh, doing PR for them. So we have a, a very seasoned team. Um, and I think more than that, everyone is passionate about what we're doing. That's awesome. That is awesome. So just moving a little bit more towards the local or state level, are there uh, local organizations that the Seattle chapter and um, Jean maybe over on the east side that you're, um, that you're working with currently um, that our local associations could also partner with or collaborate with? And if so, what initiatives are they working on currently and is there an opportunity for the local and or the state association to collaborate on some of those? Yeah, great question. So one of the things that we have charged our chapter program, each chapter individually with, is to identify um, something local to the footprint, an organization or a cause that resonates with that community and support them philanthropically. Um, we are not a charity. We have no reason to become a charity. And we would rather spend time building up the charities that do exist and align with our mission than trying to recreate something that, that's already out there. So um, you all have something that I'm incredibly close to and is near and dear to my heart. And that is the Pacific Northwest chapter of PFLAG. And 
uh, Drew Griffin, who is the former director of, of that uh, region, was part of our steering committee. He helped us build this organization. Drew subsided to cancer shortly uh, before Christmas last year. And unfortunately we lost Drew, uh, major blow to our organization. However, we wanted to keep that relationship intact because the work that PFLAG does is, um, it's irreplaceable to be frank. So PFLAG, uh, parents and friends of, now it's LGBTQs um, and it acts both as a support group for folks that are going through the process of coming out or have a loved one or friend coming out. It also acts as a resource for those in the community who are on their journey, um, which we call it a journey because you're constantly evolving um, through the process of, of the LGBTQ experience. And they offer resources that other organizations simply don't right now. And, and so the Alliance is very passionate about that organization, specifically the, the Eastern Washington chapter has adopted the uh, Northwest region of, of PFLAG, which also obviously is from Coeur d'Alene all the way down to Boise and over to Portland as well. Um, and so we work closely with them. I will tell you, uh, we just awarded Drew Griff Griffin, uh, while he was still with us, um, a, an award that came with a, a $5,000 grant, which we're writing to the local chapter and we're matching that with national as well. We're doing something similar on, on the East Coast. Um, if there was one organization I could advocate for, if, for folks who are looking to back a charity, it would be that one. Um, do you have any tips for creating inclusive company practices? Hmm. Well, so many of you have the, um, the privilege of being either self-employed or, or making your own schedules. Um, for those of you who run teams or brokerages or, or have a management position, my 10 years in corporate America taught me how important it is to understand that we're all coming from different places and not just perspectives, but completely different walks of life. And if you're creating an environment where your team or your employees or your coworkers can bring their authentic selves to work every day, when they cross the threshold of their door out to their car to drive in, then you're doing something right. It's situations where people feel like they have to transform into someone else before they show up professionally, that that's where you're going to find burnout, you're going to find depression, you're going to find someone that isn't long for the career. Um, and frankly, it reflects in how they work with their clients as well. So I would say the most important thing would be to build an environment that fosters folks to feel good about who they are, and own that in every aspect of what they do, including their professional life. Um, and then this is kind of a very overarching question, big, broad base. Um, what does pride mean to you? To me? Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, not what it used to. And let me give some context to that. So for those of you who don't know where, where pride came from, um, a little bar in Greenwich Village in New York City in 1969, stood up and said, we've had enough of these basically phony discriminatory police raids. The Stonewall Inn was a safe space for folks in the LGBTQ community and had been notorious for that. And at that point in time in the late 60s, there were laws on the books in New York that gave police the authority um, to not only persecute, but prosecute folks they believe to be gay um, or cross-dressing is uh, the term that was used in, in the law. And so the evening of June 28th, I believe, 1969, which we now call the Stonewall Riots, um, that club ended up pouring out into the streets and taking a stand against the raid that they were under that evening. It had happened dozens of times previously, but the club had never actually stood up for itself. And through that action, the residents of Greenwich Village poured out of their condos and stood on the streets. And eventually that police line broke itself and retreated back to the station. It was a big victory for the community. Now, Several years later, that evolved into pride, but getting from that point to what we know pride as today, 
I think it's the history that needs to resonate. And I'll go as far as saying with my generation, the millennial generation, the generation under me, I don't know that there's just a lot of appreciation. And I think that's because the history is, is lost as we continue to get further and further away from that. Um, and folks need to understand why we're able to do what we can do today because uh, we didn't fight for it like the generations before us did. So I, I say it's been an evolution for me because I, I can tell you when I was 18, 19, um, 21, 23, I used to have a hell of a lot of fun on Pride Weekend in the Twin Cities um, with very little sleep and probably too much consumption. Um, but that has changed dramatically uh, over, over the course of my life. And I think now just reflecting on where we came from and being grateful to have the opportunity to be who we are in public spaces and not, not shy away from that. I think that's what pride is all about. The ability to, if I want, and no one wants to see me in booty shorts, trust me, but if I wanted to uh, walk in a parade and be who I wanted to be, I can do that today because of the folks that fought for that right uh, in the 60s and 70s. Well, you know, that's all the questions that I have. So do we have any questions in the chat, Liz? Or does anyone want to just unmute and ask Ryan some questions? Don't have any questions in the chat, just some comments. If you're interested in Eastern Washington, um, you can reach out to Gene and his email's in there. He put that email. Thank you, Gene. Any questions? And I will, oh, does somebody have, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Did somebody raise their hand? I don't see any, but go ahead, Sandy. Oh, I was just gonna say the certification that you talked about yeah. um, that you're offering is, that's for me, that's amazing. Cause I know that in, in Tacoma, we had been working with the Rainbow Center, um, mm -hmm. trying to find a way to help them identify realtors who were friendly to the community. And there wasn't an easy way to do that. Um, and that actually is gonna be, that'll be a great tool that we can take to them and say, hey, take a look at this and what do you think? And um, yeah, can we promote this? And if we promote this, will you help promote us? Um, Within your within your organization, um, that's amazing. It's going to be great, and the CE credits too. We need more of that, and we just actually I don't know I'm sure if you heard that um, we just passed legislation here where um, diversity clock hours are mandatory now. There's for every for your initial uh, licensing, and then all of your subsequent renewals, you have to take three hours of diversity training. So. Yes, Desda, and I'm thrilled. I am too thrilled that Nara's and Nara is on board with all of this. This is amazing. Yeah, so. and you know, I'll go as far as telling you that. Um, so, first of all, they've been absolutely phenomenal, like to a, an unprecedented degree. And I worked with with President Malta very close to get us to this point, and, and President Oppler has taken that baton. Um, but we have been invited by NAR's education wing to substantially help them redraw aspects of the ABR credentialing program and at home with diversity to include more um, LGBTQ insight in, into those curriculums. So that's an ongoing process that we just started last week formally. Um, they will be referring to, we put out a, a first time home buyer guide earlier this year. Um, they'll be making reference to that as well as the, the white paper that we published as part of the curriculums going forward. So we're very excited that um, we're in the time and the space that we're in where NAR is so eager to work with us. And that's the other thing. I mean, you know, if you look at historically the past 20 years, 2020 was just mind bending in so many ways, but, and I understand I'm in the Twin Cities. I, I lived through the past year um, in very real time. And for those of you in, in Seattle, uh, you lived it also <laughs> in very real time. And, and so I can tell you, I think the positive result of what happened, the, and you'll have to forgive me if it's offensive to anyone, but I'm, I'm pretty stuck in my convictions. The lynching of George Floyd here in the Twin Cities 
uh, if there's one positive that came out from that, it is a mandate that has swept society in the last year to be more inclusive, to be more equitable, and to be more open-minded and aware of, of your surroundings. So because of, of that and the sacrifice that was made there, I think that we have a unique opportunity, as so many other organizations and businesses do around the country, to really practice what we preach. And I, I hope that that is what you're seeing um, through our education wing, through our, our philanthropy wing, through our advocacy wing. That's, that's really what we're trying to do. Um, I saw in the chat that Sharinda had a question, but she isn't able to raise her hand. So go ahead and unmute. Yes. Um, hi. So my name is Sharinda, and I work with the YWCA here in Washington. I'm in the Everett region. Um, and I found this call, and I thought it was very interesting um, just to be on here and learn more. But I did have a question. So I know you guys obviously are, um, you know, directed towards buying and selling of homes and, you know, support in the LGBTQ plus community. What, what sort of resources or what would you recommend for individuals who are renting or looking for homes that are, uh, you know, LGBTQ plus um, and of co people of color? Because that is a focus that we have here at the YWCA. Um, and it is very hard sometimes for people to find housing where they feel accepted or they're not discriminated against based on the color of their skin or their, you know, orientation. Um, so what, what would you recommend for those people? Because we work with a lot of, you know, homeless or people that are at risk for homelessness. So, Sure. Specific to our community, and, and thank you, by the way, for joining us. Um, yeah. Specific to our community, I can tell you that there are LGBTQ centers around the country mm -hmm. um, that specifically engage in those activities. For us, that would take the form of the first time home buyer seminar, which is free to attend, um, mm -hmm. where we've actually rounded up several real estate professionals and, and lending professionals who will go through the 101 of buying and selling. Um, and then it's Q&A for the rest of that session. So it's a great opportunity. Um, I know that, that Washington State has several um, phenomenal state level and local down payment assistance programs. Um, people are too often um, either scared from those or shy away from those because of the complications they anticipate with them. But it really is a make or break for some folks in their situation as to whether or not they're going to get into a house or not. Um, we're constantly working to to get to that renter who wants to start building generational wealth through purchase. And it's a challenge that we face because <laughs> from my own personal experience, I can tell you it is not comfortable sitting across the table from a 60 year old white straight man trying to explain what all these gay bar charges on your bank statement are when you're going through the mortgage approval process. It's not a comfortable dialogue. And that automatically brings apprehension of going through the process. So we're trying to break down some of those walls um, and provide a much more comfortable, safer space through our organization to link folks with professionals who are going to offer an equitable, non-judgmental experience. So. Great, okay, thank you. Thanks. And I would just add to that maybe, you know, I don't know what area you're in, but there are a lot of local organizations um, like in Tacoma, we've got the Tacoma Urban League, we've got um, the Rainbow Center um, that have resources and you can reach out to them and ask them for, if they've, if they've got, you know, folks that can guide you on that. Um, and then if you're not in that particular area, um, they can probably guide you to folks in your area. I'm guessing. Okay. Um, yeah. Cause Rainbow, are, I know the I, Rainbow Center is pretty broad reaching, um, but I just, I don't know, not being in Seattle or on the East side, I don't know wh wh where those local organizations are, or what they, who they are. Um, but I know of those two at the very least in the Tacoma area that can probably give you some guidance. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, we don't, um, we, that I am aware of, and I've looked, um, we're in Snohomish County, which is about an hour out from Tacoma and even some of the Seattle area. Um, so for, for our area, there really just isn't anything. And that's the trouble that we're finding is that 
a lot of our um, the people that we serve here, you know, they're they're not that mobile. Um, so having something centralized to our location and close by is very very hard to come by, and that's a huge barrier for them. Just not feeling, you know, included and in, and not having the resources and the support that they need in order to be successful. So, okay, but I can definitely reach out and see if maybe they have something local. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm reading a comment um, in the chat from Kelsey. Kelsey is self-identified as, as a B in the acronym. Um, and I, I just, I think it's important what she said, and I still want to take the course. This course is for everyone. You don't have to be in a straight ally. I can tell you as a, a cisgender white gay man leading this organization, I am an ally to every other letter in our acronym. And that allyship is created because I'm not living that same life experience that um, especially those in, in the transgender community have to live. So I consider myself an ally as well, even though I'm part of the community. So I just want to clarify that this course is not just for straight allies. This course is for folks inside of our community as well. Awesome. And on that note, Ryan, there was a question. Is there a term other than ally? when the realtor is also gay. So let me dive at that question a little bit when, just so I can understand it, when the realtor is gay working with a gay client? I'm not sure. I don't sure. know who asked this. Uh, Laura did. Laura, if you're com comfortable giving more context to that, I think, in, at least in my experience, um, the term ally is a pretty broad term that's encompassing of a, a lot of different scenarios. <laughs> Anyone who's part of the community will recognize that when I say family or going to the same church, we're talking about folks that are in the community as well. Um, so, you know, there, there are some casual terms for it, but allyship and, and being an ally is a fairly nationally recognized term for that. So without more context, I'm, I'm not sure. Jean, are you still on? Jean, I, sometimes Jean mentors me on some of this stuff too. Jean, in your experience, is, is there another term out there that you're aware of? No, um, no, I think that you're on target. I don't think there really is a, a different term. Although one thing that I've learned being a boomer in this community is that terms have certainly evolved over yes. the years since I came out in 1974. So um, things have certainly evolved. And I suspect that that's another case of evolution that we'll soon see. Yeah. And Gene, thank you for bringing that up. So that's a, a great time to reflect on that evolution. Um, specifically, the word queer and is what I think you're alluding to, Gene. Um, if you talk to folks in my generation or the generation below us, that's uh, kind of a broad sweeping term now to describe someone who is part of the LGBTQ community, part of the queer community. Um, that was a very derogatory, hurtful, incendiary term to folks, um, even Gen X, but for sure Boomer. Um, and there are a lot of emotions that are brought up when that term is used. And it's an interesting conversation. In fact, one that I had with Drew before he passed do the younger generations understand the weight that that carries? Is the fact that there are six generations currently walking the earth, does that offer another you know, intersectionality point that we need to better address? I think the answer to that is yes. But um, I think understanding that what Gene said, the evolution is real and that your kids or friends of your kids, I guarantee identify as non-binary or two-spirited or have no problem identifying at the age of 12 that they are gay before they might even understand the full width of what that means. And so the times are changing and, and society is evolving, um, hopefully for the better, but I think there will be more of that, Gene. And, and I, I appreciate you bringing that up because that is a very real thing, a conversation that takes place very often takes place in my house even with my 17 year old who's you know he has friends who are gay and they use terminology they use the word queer and I'm like but you don't get to use that word and trying to explain to him why he doesn't get to use that word I think that 
I think every parent needs to have that conversation with their kids about what is acceptable and what is not. And I think that we don't because we don't know either. And so it's a matter of educating ourselves about that so that we can have those conversations. Um, yeah, but it's a, it's a different world, honestly, watching in, in my kid, like my youngest is 17. Um, so watching the evolution of just from when I was his age, their ages, and, um, and my brother was gay and he didn't come out until shortly before he passed, which was, you know, he was 20 um, before he was comfortable even telling me um, that's not the case anymore. And so it's, we all need to kind of, we all need to, to educate ourselves and be able to have those educated conversations with our kids. Absolutely. Hi there. Um, my name is James and I'm, I'm from Seattle, but funny enough, I'm actually in Minnetonka, Minnesota right now. You're kidding. <laughs> That's wonderful. Are you on the lake? No, um, but that, there's got to be one really close by. Apparently there's like thousands of them around here. Yeah, um, well, 10,000 actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if this is a question for you, Ryan, or for Sandy, but um, this is the first time I, I've heard of the organization. I'm relatively new into real estate altogether. I started in October with Coldwell Banker Bain on the Capitol, on, in Capitol Hill. And um, I'm just curious to know, maybe on the website, if there are resources for both members uh, or customers that want to turn into a client um, looking for a realtor, just resources for, I'll, I'll guess, uh, I'll say with members first, for us to uh, be more aware and inclusive, you know, even though we might identify as part of the the um, the LGBTQIA plus, et cetera, it just more. Uh, I think that it's it's a constantly evolving community and always finding ways to uh, make people feel included. If there are resources for us, classes for us to join in on. Additionally, are there resources for the community to find not just a realtor, but numerous um, types of assistance? Yeah, great question. So I'm going to go ahead and drop a link in the chat. Um, that actually links directly to our new consumer landing page. And if you go there, you'll see that um, in scrolling down, we we have presented our first time home buyer guide to any consumer that wants to download it. This has a comprehensive list of services outside and inside real estate that folks can seek. Um, realtors, obviously, you, you can't steer. It's just a fact of, of the code of ethics at NAR, and, and I'm grateful for it. However, we're 501c6, so we do have the opportunity to provide different information um, because we're not held to that same code. We're not actively selling real estate. And if people come to us and say, well, we'd like to identify a safe community, we're more than happy to provide the resources for them to be able to do that. So I recommend check out that first time home buyer guide on the same site, you're able to download that report from an education stance, James, that report is gonna, it presented facts to me that my jaw dropped at. Um, and what we've done is we've taken stats and figures and we've laced them with real life testimonial. Gene was a contributing uh, member of, of that report. So he's got some blurbs in there as well, but, um, it's long, it's 42 pages, I think, but it's, it's worth the read. It's not bedtime reading. Um, but we do offer resources to the extent that, that we can. More will come online. We, we're trying to get through our one year birthday first. Yes, per, one, one step at a time. That was perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And maybe that's something that at the state level we can work with um, our Washington chapters with as well as creating a list of resources that we can Put on our website for folks for our membership um, who are are looking for those resources. So that would be a great way to to partner up. Are there any other questions? Hi, Ryan. Um, my name is Angie Michael. I'm in. Uh, in the Seattle area as well. And I first just wanna thank you so much for your article that Inman uh, published, was that last week or two weeks ago? It was great. Um, I actually printed it out and it's hanging on my board. 
<laughs> I have forwarded it to a lot of people. And for those of you that maybe didn't have an opportunity to read it, I highly encourage you. I think it really made the connection of um, that discrimination doesn't start at the loan application and that and what the impacts of discriminatory practices against our youth. And so thank you. That's first. Um, second, as um, an office leader, one of my uh, initiatives is to be um, to create a more inclusive workplace right and as as a queer broker and um, a member of the community I just assume you know everyone's welcome everyone's welcome and now as um, Keller Williams is actually recognizing Juneteenth as uh, as our holiday and I'm so excited about that and now what I'm looking for is you know um, what are what do you feel are best practices around not only recognizing pride, but the intersectionality of Juneteenth as well. And, you know, I know that I'm asking a, uh, you know, white person about practicing, you know, um, inclusivity around Juneteenth, but I'm just curious, you know, how do you see that working and, and um, what can we do to include um, our, um, you know, people of color into this conversation of pride? Great question. Um, and with respect to the time, if anyone needs to jump off, I'm, I'm understanding of that. But let me take a stab at it. And I think the first thing to say is that when we're having discussions like this and in crowds like this, it's incredibly important to understand that we're on the same side. And so um, too often have I been in a position where I have been attacked for leading this organization as a white male. And I'm receptive to where that comes from. Um, I will tell you, I am very comfortable with the fact that I, I have white privilege and I'm also very comfortable knowing that I use that to try and, and help the better good. But I think it's important to understand that good intention overrides physical appearance. And if we're all working towards the same outcome, especially in the same circles and the same community, it's okay to invite folks to join in and not necessarily chastise or isolate them because of where they're coming from or what they look like. Um, my sister, this is actually not a, a widely known fact at all. My, my sister is biracial um, and she's going through some major identity issues with her oldest son, who is now a quarter black and has absolutely no black role models in his life. So much so that I will share that um, he defaced some Black Lives Matter signs with some hockey buddies and didn't understand what he was doing. I don't know if he knows that he's black. So it's so important in any community to understand that the intersectionality is deeper than, than eye level. Um, for us at the Alliance, we have created team member networks, which we call ARGs, to provide safe space for folks who are part of more than one diverse segment. Whether it's the veteran community, we have PRISM, which is our professionals of color organization. Um, and we give them free reign to focus on programming for the rest of the Alliance that would benefit from it, um, but may not be a part of that community. I'm not a veteran. For me to do veteran programming would just come from a, a place where my, my family was stationed on Whidbey Island for 20 years. So I'm receptive to it, right? But I'm not the one that should be teaching it. Um, giving folks the opportunity to come in and lead the conversation that are directly from that intersectionality I think is the best answer. And then making sure that your team, Angie, is open to that. A good conversation is gonna make you feel uncomfortable. Is there anything else before we wrap up? Thank you for that question, Angie, that was great. Yeah. Anyone else? This was a treat, folks. I, I appreciate the questions. I appreciate the time that I was able to spend. Sandy, Liz, you're doing wonderful things. Really, I mean that. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you for everybody that attended and we'll close it out. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye folks. Bye.